I don't know if, you know, make suggestions on what and what not to do with your life, but we own a podcast. We tell people what to do. Exactly. Take our advice. It's good for you. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Gears. My name is Grayson Harris. That's Carson Sharp over there. And we got the uh, peanut gallery in the back. We're going to be chiming in a little bit more than usual today because we all have opinions on this particular topic. Uh, Show of hands here, guys. Who's had issues buying a home in the last year or two? Yeah. All right, all right. Pretty much everybody here has had at least some sort of story of how hard it's been to get a house over the last couple of years. It's not just speculation either. The National Association of Realtors actually confirmed what most of us already pretty much know to be true. Due to rising interest rates and low inventory, the National Association of Realtors found that the average income of a homeowner between July of 2022 and June of 2023, so this past year or so, was about $107,000, meaning you have to bring in $107,000 a year to be able able to afford a home. Back in the day, that was 88,000. And that was not that long ago either. So this basically has spiked in the last few years, making home ownership pretty much an almost impossibility for people in our age bracket. Why is it then that it's so hard to get a house? Why is it that our parents had literally no issue getting a home and basically making it seem as though it was an expectation that we would all own homes at 20. As a matter of fact, if you were 29 in the 1980s, chances are you did own a home, but now that median homeowner age has gone up to 35. So average home price in 1980, $47,000. Average home price 2023, 436,000. That's a nine times increase. A 20% down payment, which is typical when buying a home, in 1980, it would have been $9,400. Today, you're looking at 87,000, which is a 20% increase. Interest rates in the 80s were 14.6% compared to roughly seven, seven and a half today. So your monthly payment in 1980 would have been 436 bucks a month for that $47,000 house. Mm-hmm. Compared to today, you're looking at roughly 2400 bucks, which is a 6% increase mm-hmm. in your monthly payment. Now let's also relate this to average income. Yeah. In 1980, Average income, average household income, which is important to note, was $21,000, which today it is $88,000. Now, that is a significant increase. It's a four times increase. But when you consider that the average home price has risen nine times, while incomes have only increased four times, you kind of start to see the difficulties that most people in our generation tend to have when looking at real estate. Yeah, exactly. And it was not that long ago where the housing market seemed like almost the perfect bet because prices kept going up. Everybody was able to get homes. They were buying extremely expensive homes in cash, uh, at least in the early 2000s. That, of course, leads us to the infamous housing market crash uh, that happened in the late 2000s. Maybe the best way to, to explain it would be just a crash course in what happened in 2008, 2009. Exactly. When you go to a bank or go to a lender to get a mortgage, your mortgage hardly ever stays in house. That mortgage, at least at the time, it was packaged together with hundreds if not thousands of other mortgages and sold to bankers on Wall Street. What was happening is these sub, they were considered subprime mortgages. Everybody's probably heard the story at this point, Mm -hmm. but they were given a AAA rating, credit rating. When they get a AAA credit rating, it's considered a rock solid investment. All these investment uh, institutions were buying up these AAA rated subprime mortgages. The problem is the banks at the time were extending loans to people they had no business extending loans to. So, you know, somebody making $50,000 a year was getting approved on a one and a half million dollar house. Yeah. It just didn't make any sense. When that person obviously at the end of the day can't make their mortgage payment, they just stop making their mortgage payment. These some prob mortgages that are all grouped together with a AAA credit rating, they just fell apart. Yeah. So you had a lot of banks repossessing properties. And then of course, everything that we all know happened in 2008 with the global financial crisis caused by the housing bubble, which led us to a subsequent recovery, which again, we see during COVID what happened with the housing market again. I think we saw some shakeup during COVID not caused by irresponsible lending, but more or less you could say just by people's habits during that time. Yeah, in the immediate, I guess, aftermath of the uh, of that crash, home prices recorded an 18% decline at that point. Homes in places like Phoenix, Las Vegas, San Francisco, they're falling 30% year over year. I mean, before then, obviously, the market was relatively affordable, obviously, mm-hmm. for several reasons. You had rising incomes, you had favorable tax treatment of owner-occupied housing as marginal tax rates were increasing, and obviously, you had the development of a modern like mortgage finance system. Well, that system was great 
great until it wasn't, <laughs> essentially, is, is kind of what happened there. In 1960, housing starts were at around 1,460, and then by 2000, they're at 1,737. Just 10 years later, in 2010, they're down to 539. So no one's building homes. By 2020, they had pretty much recovered. They had gotten back to about 1,600. And I don't know about you. What happened in 2020? I don't remember. Oh, just talking about the, the global pandemic that oh, happened that in 2020. One. Is that what you're talking about? That one. That affected everyone? <laughs> That's crazy. What we started noticing, at least in the aftermath of the pandemic, as you started to go back out and people were had the buying power to possibly start buying homes again, what they found out was, oh, wait, this actually is kind of impossible. Mm -hmm. And there are several factors associated with it. Not any one is more like significant than the other. They all contribute to what we are currently in right now. I know for us living in Chattanooga, I, I live in downtown Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. I can probably throw a ping pong ball from apartment building to apartment building because they just keep springing up all yeah. over the place. Everywhere you look, new construction in mm -hmm. town. And I, I think this goes for a lot of other cities, similar size of yeah. the, to Chattanooga. It seems like they're building more apartments than the city can support. The fall of people being able to buy homes and the rise of people having to rent them. I mean, when you can't afford your nearly $90,000 down payment, it leaves you with no other option. You know, you either go move into mom and dad's basement mm -hmm. <laughs> or you pay upwards of, you know, a thousand to $1,500 a month yeah. for a one bedroom apartment. In the grand scheme of things, home ownership creates wealth for for people in the United States. It always has and it always will. Uh, real estate is always gonna be, or generally, is an appreciating asset. We all see this with our parents' generation mm -hmm. and you know, buying the house in the 70s or the 80s for less than $100,000 in yeah. some cases and selling it 15 years later for over a million. So it's, it's an appreciating asset mm -hmm. that I think everybody certainly still wants a part of. Sure. It just seems that barriers to entry have gotten substantially greater. They have, and I've seen a significant rise in real estate investors over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And this may just be because everyone that I went to high school with is now a real estate investor. Or, or a realtor. Yeah, or a realtor. I probably know like 20 realtors. Exactly, it seems like a great business to be in. Well, that's assuming, this is a bit of a tangent, but the National Association of Realtors, it's funny that they revealed that nobody can buy homes during the same time that they're currently in a legal battle because they had apparently conspired with brokerages to inflate commissions. Really? Yeah. That's. Yeah, and so <laughs> if that holds up, then commission could decrease by as much as 30%, right? So mm -hmm. that's something else down the line that we need to probably keep an eye on. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's kind of hilarious that they sort of told on themselves. Going back to my point about investors is that what they started noticing is, wow, it's really easy to make money when you're doing it passively. Mm -hmm. When you can buy this land or if you can build a duplex or if you got the money for it, build an apartment building, it's gonna pay for itself eventually. Eventually, and it, and it won't take long. It's yeah. it's a pretty secure investment if you have the capital for it because yeah. like we already mentioned, people can't afford to get into a home of their own. So mm -hmm. they're left with no other choice but to, you know, mom and dad's basement, sleep in your car, or get a you know luxury apartment, because every apartment yeah. popping up these days is luxury living. So yeah, it leaves people with no choice but to pay the rent. You have, in a lot of cases, out of town investors that come in. Oh, most of the time. Yeah, I the majority say. of the time. That's that's the frustrating part, is especially as somebody who was looking for a home, is like, even with the interest rates so high, everything is getting bought up and if it's not getting bought up there's something wrong with it <laughs> like yeah, like right. tremendous and i mean i mean you can't even stand on the floors something wrong with it yeah you know how many houses i toured where i walked in and it felt like i was walking on a fun house mirror i am very glad that they're actually finally regulating that so that other people can buy houses and create equity a lot of municipalities are beginning to regulate it say what you want about government regulation i support this one you support this one i support um, this one How, now, but can they do it well that's that's the thing that's what exactly what i'm getting at mm -hmm. and recently the city of chattanooga also instituted a moratorium on short-term vacation rental licenses so now if you're buying a property as an investment property and you're going to list it for rent for less than 30 days at a time it's considered an stvr short-term vacation rental and you have to have a permit from the city but they they issued 
a moratorium on issuing new licenses. But the question is, as you mentioned, how do you enforce it? The The city of Chattanooga recently, I, I believe I read that they actually got sued by a lot of these property owners. And I think the city may have reconsidered how to implement this. Well, I think they started it with Atlanta, you know, our close neighbor who implemented that whole uh, Airbnb thing. I mean, because try, try to find a house. You think it's hard to find a house in Chattanooga? Try to find a house in Atlanta. Oh, an affordable house that you want to live in. Yeah. It's it's there to, essentially to protect the locals to be able to afford housing within their own city. Because again, when you have out-of-town investors, and I, and I believe we saw a lot of this during COVID, people leaving major metropolitan areas with relatively high cost of living, such as New York City, Southern California, areas like that, and moving to areas with a relatively lower cost of living. So Tennessee was a huge one, a huge, and uh, so was Texas. And that will, in COVID kind of allowed that, you know, because so many people went to work from home, yeah. you know, people can live, you know, you see these, these TikToks of people living in the middle of nowhere and they're like, ha, good luck guys. I bought this house, you know, with, Forty thousand for forty thousand dollars, you know, yeah. and it's like a mansion. Yeah, and that's that's the key too. Is you know, you can work from home, you can have your big city job with your big city income, but you can live in Middle America where the cost of living is substantially lower comparative to your your income. So a lot of the people that that are selling their one bedroom townhouse in the suburbs of Los Angeles for one and a half, two million dollars, move to Tennessee and pay cash for a four bedroom you know, four bath, $500,000 house, uh, not to mention the fact that in a lot of cases, you know, speaking from my personal experience, they're offering over the asking price for a lot of these houses and pricing people out. I remember putting in an offer several years ago with a realtor for multiple houses and she would call me 20 minutes later and say, Hey, somebody outbid you by $25,000. Yeah. That's... So it's like, what, what do I do in that case? So I, I have spent the grand majority of this year looking for my first house and i'm still looking um because i had put in offers on uh, i think three different houses and not only did i get beat out on all three of them by a lot mm -hmm. but they were all bought by investors who were on their fourth fifth sixth house i can't even get in my first and so what this ends up doing is this this system creates where it's the haves and the have nots so that's always you can say it's always that way for everything of course but it's just for this and thing in particular this seems like it's becoming a bigger crisis day by day because the people who have all the rental properties and the land and the assets like you said for the most part it's a stable investment it's just going to keep getting bigger which means mm -hmm. they can buy more and they can buy more and they keep getting more money more money yeah and i can't even get started no one else can get started. I don't even want a second house. I just want my first. <laughs> and yeah. I can't do it just because of the way that it's gone lately. And I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pocket watch anybody. If this, if this is how you want to make money in a capitalistic society, you can do that. That's, yeah. that's how it works. Doesn't mean I'm happy about it. I will say arguably though, you know, and I guess this is a matter of opinion, but when you think about it, all these people buying these rentals and these vacation homes, they're not creating equity for the neighborhood. They're just worried about, you know, you get people in and out. There's no community being built so it's like what's going to happen to those communities when the economy tanks those are immediately going to be the communities that are affected yeah. yeah and that's another aspect i guess that i didn't consider as well as just communityless neighborhoods another part too is when out-of-town investors pay above market value or above asking price for instance for a for a home or a property it does drive up the property values it, it just it does because when one house sells for more well now if you're looking at comps in the area you can sell your house for more i don't want to say it, it helps people who currently own homes in that area potentially just by driving up their property value but at the same time it prices out majority of people especially first-time home buyers who in most cases are people in their late 20s to mid 30s yeah and you know me personally i wouldn't necessarily want to live next to a house that was being rented out every 30 days i've got a killer story for that actually so my friend bought a house his next door neighbor was using the building and then he also built a little like trailer truck thing he rented out as an airbnb so he had two airbnbs on the same property but he also had goats he would live there on the property periodically and he, you know he would obviously come and feed the goats or whatever but he's not there the goats get out the goats 
run over and jump on my friend's truck. And they're, and they're just like she's using it as a jungle gym, just pouncing on his truck. See what happens when you invest in homes. You destroy <laughs> property with your goat. It's a slippery slope, right? It sure is, man. Even if you're able to somehow find a home that investors aren't actually all that interested in for whatever reason, and there's nothing wrong with the house, and it's not a fun house mirror floor, and everything's all good, it's still going to be too expensive. So what do you do in response to this besides, as we already mentioned, parents' basement, yeah. expensive apartment, yeah. or live in your car? Nobody wants to do that, but you're left with little alternative. But what, what can we do? I think one thing that a lot of people may forget about is you're going to have to make some sacrifices somewhere. So you may have to start looking in a less desirable area. You may have to move further outside of the city to get cheaper real estate. There's always the term about the starter house or the fixer upper. That may be an option for, for a lot of first time home buyers that can't, you know, can't afford a turnkey property, but they can afford the fixer upper if you have the time and the knowledge. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's gonna pay off. When you when you eventually sell that property, you've built equity into it. So long as we don't have another two thousand eight. Right. <laughs> Just right. don't don't sell it then. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and so part of the problem, and this kind of goes back to the comparison of you know why our parents were able to own homes and we aren't. It's because you buy too much avocado. Type. That's exactly you know, and I, I just, <laughs> just on Pinterest too much. You yeah, know? what we're seeing here isn't just you know, all the homes are getting bought up. It's it's literally just you know I can't afford it. And and part of that there is an interesting theory, and I, I remember you were bringing it up earlier that one of the explanations could be that that the millennial generation, for example, mm -hmm. just has a lot of students loan debt. That's actually a key citation that people make when they're asked, why can you not buy your first home? The majority of people in the millennial generation cite student loan as the reason why they can't, which makes a lot of sense. I'll actually attest to that because the reason I was able to afford a home was because they had the credit rollback of student loans during the pandemic. Whenever they you know, stopped loan payments, they also rolled back your credit so that your student loans couldn't affect your credit. And that was the only reason that I was able to buy a home. So essentially, even if you have saved the money, your credit will still be bad if you missed a payment or so on and so forth, you know? When you think about how hard it is to get your credit back up, when you have, when you're paying off a 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 dollar loan. I don't know if, you know, make suggestions on what and what not to do with your life, but- We own a millennial, podcast, we tell people we own, what to exactly. do. Exactly, take yeah. our advice, it's good for you. Millennials are actually delaying their first home purchase by up to about seven years due directly to their student loan payments. So when they would be, minus the student loans, they would buy a house seven years earlier. So I don't know, again, do what you want to do with your own life, but should, in this on a tangent, I'm sorry. No, go for it. But should we consider not going to college if you want to buy your first that home is a before tangent. you're 40? <laughs> <laughs> that, there that, you go. That is a tangent. Well, and we're not advocating for that, by the way. <laughs> School is whack, kids. Millennials, we are the, the most educated generation if you consider the amounts of degrees held by a generation. So millennials hold the most degrees. We also cite student loan debt as the reason why we can't afford houses. Mm -hmm. So should we as a generation consider telling our children to not just go to college just because you're told that you'll get a good job one day? Because when I was, and, and I'm just saying this from, from personal experience, when I grew up going yeah. to elementary school, middle school, high school, it was always, where are you going to go to college? It's like, I'm 12. I don't know. <laughs> where are you going to go to college? I'm, you would yeah. literally up until you graduated from high school, you were pushed to go to college. Yeah. And, and I think that's because our parents, that's what they did. And so that's all they knew. Most of our parents, not everyone, but mm -hmm most of our parents and that's what they knew. I'm not saying don't go to college. I'm saying that we should maybe consider if you're going to go to college, why are you going? And don't take out a six-figure student loan mm -hmm. to major in underwater basket weaving where there's no jobs <laughs> available. There definitely needs to be some sort of return. A return on investment. And that's the that's the problem. Your standard liberal arts degree, in the grand scheme of things, there's not very many jobs that are going to pay you enough to repay your student loan debt and enough time to be able to afford a house. But you would think with a loan program, there would be some sort of investigation on that career field. Like, okay, um, as a college, you're not allowed to legally teach this unless you provide some sort of disclaimer saying, that hey here's the rate of employment for this field and and you know what's what's ironic is trade 
in technical schools literally do that and they're not required to well they, that's they have to i mean that's how they get you know because everybody's being encouraged to go to college yeah there's uh, people will say you know hey uh, if you come in here and learn how to hang sprinklers in commercial buildings you're gonna make a lot of money and there's a job waiting for you to do Lime. that linemen welders plumbers electricians i guess that ultimately what i'm getting at is we have the statistics that show that millennials and, and i guess gen z Mm -hmm. as well are, are delaying their home purchase specifically because of their student debt now minus that student debt could we say with certainty that they would buy a house seven to ten years earlier yeah. i don't think well, so it's one factor would, in a pile of many exactly many it's it's yeah. multifaceted but I, I think you could say that minus student debt a lot of people would buy homes okay. sooner because it's not that they don't want to buy the homes it's that they can't for you know low income right. or too many expenses, i.e. student debt. So, yeah. you know, it's something to think about, definitely something to consider. You know, maybe we all need to kind of figure out what our trade is, what our skill is, and hone hone that. Not necessarily, you know, have it be something where there's, there's this end goal of a major university or a major college thing. Maybe it's just the end goal of being really good at what you do. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, well, a lot of people can apply that same thought process to becoming a, a truck driver. Right. And if you become a truck driver, well, you know, you have your options. You can do a delivery truck, a sprinter van, dry van. Amazon. Amazon. However, don't get into the flatbed market right now. And this is this is all, you know, related to the housing and construction stuff. So we'll all kind of we'll bring it full circle here. Flatbed demand and rates are really the only ones that have bottomed out as quickly as it has like dry van rates and reefer rates and all that stuff you're seeing them come back down yeah but slowly in a way that that makes sense but with flatbeds open deck step deck any of that kind of stuff you see it you know doing just fine until 2022 and then crashes part of me wonders and there isn't really a whole bunch of correlated information that i was able to find on this so part of this is an educated guess, educated speculation, that this dramatic decline in open deck rates and demand is partly to do with the fact that there are less home starts today. I had a feeling that's the direction you were going with yeah. that. The flatbed market, as you mentioned, is tied very closely to the construction and manufacturing industries. Mm -hmm. Home starts are down, which would in turn bring down the flatbed market. You don't have construction materials, heavy equipment, building materials that all move on flatbed. Mm -hmm. And when we're not building houses, you're not hauling as much of that freight. So it depresses the flatbed market. If you want to know how the economy is doing, just look at what the freight market's doing because it's a fairly good indication of mm -hmm. whether our economy is good, whether people are spending or whether they're not. What are they spending stuff on? You're digging me a rabbit hole. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> the trucking industry, it's a good indicator of how the overall economy is doing. When the economy is slower, people are buying less stuff. When there's less stuff being bought, it doesn't need to be moved or shipped to the end user. So there's less demand for trucks and transportation, which is obviously gonna bring the trucking market down. So there's probably a little bit of a lag, but I think the trucking transportation market is a good barometer for how the overall economy is doing. I also think, you know, if there are any, you know, for example, lumber companies out there that specialize in construction and then maybe themselves have noticed, I haven't really even been shipping all that, that much stuff lately. Yeah. And now is the time to rethink what your supply chain process is. This is a brutal time for flatbed demand right now for construction spending and everything else so it may be prudent to sort of take a look at you know what you're spending your money on where you're allocating your resources and mm -hmm. it's not easy to do if you're by yourself especially trying to figure that out on your own so having a partner like kch that can look at your supply chain and figure out what your inefficiencies are and help you simplify them that's what we're here for it's a good point i don't think i could say it any better that's why I'm the host. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, if you are looking for a house this year, just know that I am legitimately rooting for you because I've, I feel all of you out there. And he doesn't need a realtor. I, I don't. Don't call me. But I guess that'll pretty much be the end of the episode for today. Thank you guys for joining us. If you have any other topics that you would like for us to cover in the future, let us know. And then, as always, check out some of our older videos for more freight market news and transportation. Check out our website. We got a newsletter, too. We have all of the things. Look at all of the things. We have social all media. the things. We, we have, have all media. the social medias. We have so much stuff. Okay, so just go down to the description. All of that stuff will be right there. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you guys next time. See ya.